it's a pleasure to be here and part of such a stimulating um, discussion that we've already had this morning. So I'd like to start uh, by asking you a question. So for the medics in the room, what disease is this slide showing? And for the non-medics, perhaps like me, which part of your body is this showing? And Christina gave us a nice clue this morning. Uh, another clue is that this disease is surprisingly common. So for those of us who might be around the age of 40, 5% of us are already showing signs of this disease. And for those of us who are a little older, in your 50s and 60s, then 30 to 50% of you are starting to show this kind of disease. So we'll come back to what this is in a minute. So I'd like to give you another question. I know I'm the last speaker before lunch, so just to build your anticipation of that food a little more, cast your minds back to breakfast. What did you eat for breakfast? Can you remember? Or cast your minds back to the last 24 hours of your diet. What did you eat over the last 24 hours? And was your last 24 hours typical of your last year? What do you regularly consume? In particular, this morning, did you have, did you have cereal for breakfast? Did you have toast? If you had toast, what sort of bread did you have? And I wonder, did you have any fruit for breakfast? Well, why am I asking you all of these questions? Well, firstly, because, of course, for our big cohort studies, these are some of the questions we're asking our participants to answer, but also because there's more of a reason. Um, this disease here, I don't know if anybody spotted it, is diverticular disease. When your colon, it's quite an unpleasant thought, but your colon starts to develop pouches or bulges. Um, and for years, people have speculated what the causes are. Um, at its mildest, we may not even be aware we've got it, or it may start to make us feel bloated, uncomfortable. Um, but more severely down the spectrum, uh, we see people who are bleeding internally. They develop peritonitis or sepsis. So it's an important disease. It's quite common. And we've talked about possible risk factors for years. More than 40 years ago, we had an idea that perhaps it's fibre in your diet uh, that's uh, associated with risk of the disease. And people with low fibre diets and more modern diets might be at risk. But only in the last decade um, have we started to address this with data, uh, and with data that really can provide reliable estimates. So here's some data. Here's some data from 700,000 women in the UK. Um, and 17,000 of those women were taken to hospital. Uh, and whilst in hospital, one of their diagnoses was diverticular disease. And so what some of you will have already seen from this slide is that women who had the higher levels of fibre in their diet had a 25% reduction um, in rates of this disease. Uh, and we also found, and I think it's quite interesting, that all fibre is not created equal, as many of you might know. And, and in terms of, of diverticular disease, the strongest associations are from cereal fibre, from grains and from fruit, hence my opening question. But this is just a little example um, from one of our studies. And this study, in fact, was the Million Women Study. Now, the Million Women Study is part of a family of studies that we work on in Oxford. And Martin Landre, if many of you were lucky enough to come last year, Martin Landre was one of the speakers, and he did a really nice introduction to some of the cohort studies we work on in Oxford. And if you like, the Million Women Study is an older sibling, a big sister, perhaps, of, of UK Biobank and China Kadori. Um, and because it's, it's, um, it's older, we started to recruit in the late 1990s. It's now um, not just very large, but has a maturity. And with that maturity comes an absolute wealth of endpoints. Uh, we get our endpoint information, as has already been alluded to with the Scandinavian model earlier in the morning, we get our endpoint um, data through national health records, uh, blessed with the NHS in the UK for lots of reasons, but for health research, obviously we're, um, we're, we're very, very fortunate. And we've linked not only to the cancer and the death registries, but as you may have heard before, um, with these cohorts, we're now linking to the hospital admissions data and the hospital procedures data. So to give you a flavour of the start of, of the sort of numbers that our research teams are now dealing with, uh, we have more than 140,000 deaths and uh, more than 170,000 incident cancers. But moreover, not many of the cohort studies that we work on and we collaborate with, we've been looking at cancer and death now for, for quite a few years. But really, in the last 10 years, what's become increasingly exciting is our ability to look across a much broader range of endpoints. And we now have 4.2 million um, hospital admissions for a whole variety of diseases. Now, um, 
As, as you may have heard in, in the introduction, my particular interest is molecular epidemiology. Um, and I'm going to go to show you some more information about how we can take some of the more traditional research questions and bring in some data from our biospecimens that we also hold in these cohorts. So in the Million Women study, for example, we've gone back and we have 20,000 blood samples from our breast cancer patients um, and 15,000 from our cardiovascular disease patients. So, so one of um, our more widely talked about pieces of research in the Million Women study, and indeed the big question that really motivated this large-scale study, was uh, what, what are the risk factors for breast cancer? And in particular, what does hormone replacement therapy do for breast cancer? Now, when the Million Women study was being set up, about 30%, 30%, of the British, um, of British women who were aged 50 to 64, 30% of them were taking hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and shortly after the Women's Health Initiative trial published in 2003, the Million Women study results came out, and they showed quite clearly a marked increase in breast cancer risk amongst women taking hormone replacement therapy. And what we really wanted to do in the Million Women study was to create context-specific um, information that might inform um, practice. We wanted to look in the British population, in the British women, and also look at formulations that were being used in the British population. So you can see here that um, HRT comes in two major types. You can have just oestrogen and opposed oestrogens. You can have oestrogen and progesterone. And what the results clearly show is that if you have the combined form of oestrogens and progesterone, you have uh, an increased risk, a twofold increased risk risk and that the effect is more marked than if you just took oestrogen alone. But we've moved on from looking at single exposures and single endpoints um, and with uh, increasing numbers of cancers accruing you can start to look at the net effect of some of these risk factors. So here you see also the results for ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer and when you put it together you can see that overall the combined incidence for these hormone related factors um, is also much stronger with this combined form of HRT. And why is that interesting? Well, curiously and interestingly, in 2000, the year 2000, if you still had your uterus, you hadn't had a hysterectomy, you were indeed being told that the best form of HRT for you was this combined form, um, because we know that for endometrial cancer, unopposed estrogens are harmful. So, in fact, the, the uh, people were focusing on this increased risk for endometrial cancer, prescribing the combined form of HRT. When you, when you look across multiple endpoints, it's now very clear to us that because breast cancer is so much more common um, and driving the, the relationship, then we really should be avoiding combined HRT. But it's no good just posing these big research questions, setting up these big studies. As we've heard very appropriately time and time again already this morning, it's no good just having this knowledge unless there's an impact of the data. Uh, and the impact of, of the Women's Health Initiative and study and the Million Women's Study publications has been to see this big decline in HRT use. So within five years, HRT use had declined from 30% to 15%. So that's a more traditional study. It's been out, those results have been out for a while. What I've been interested to do is to then take the genetic data we've also got for the women um, and ask in a, in a very large um, scale, well-powered uh, context, are there any interactions between these well-established classic risk factors for breast cancer and what we've more recently learned about common genetic variants that are associated with risk. And in particular, there was a hypothesis about one common variant, FGFR2, um, and HRT use, and suggesting that there might be some differential effect um, for HRT use among people carrying this common variant. So we put together the data, um, and we found uh, with more than 120 tests for interaction, no evidence of a strong interaction, meaning that the effects of these common, newly recognized genetic polymorphisms associated with breast cancer risk and the effect of our established hormonal reproductive risk factors for breast cancer seem to be acting independently. So as I said, when we think of our large cohort studies, we tend to first think of cancer, we tend to first think of deaths, but obviously now uh, we're going much beyond that. Uh, and just to give you a flavor of some of the numbers we've got in our vascular disease program,
No. Oh, you can hear me now. So the power of these beautiful modern technology had run out of battery. So we're back, and we're now a little bit more delayed till your, your promise of food for lunch, but not too much more delayed. But I think these data are really important because they show you the numbers. 110,000 um, instant uh, ischemic heart disease cases, uh, but not just the big big commonly studied diseases like ischemic heart disease, but now coming down into rarer subtypes of cardiovascular disease. And, and moreover, not only have we got details of these endpoints from our hospital episodes, that we've done quite a lot of work to validate these endpoints. So uh, continue, I'm regretful to sort of be here and saying this in 2015, but if we're talking about big issues and big data in population health, there's no bigger issue still than smoking. Um, one of the questions in the Million Women study we set out to look at is what happens to women who have smoked like men, um, women who've smoked throughout their life course um, and smoked heavily, um, what are the risks associated with smoking? And in this cohort, we have seen indeed that women who smoke like men die like men with a threefold risk of death. Um, but that message is not particularly new. Perhaps it's not powerful when we're talking about the impact of our research. What I think is more powerful is the results that show that smoking cessation absolutely works. And so if you smoke till you're 40, you have a 30% elevated risk of death, but that's substantially less than continuing to smoke. It's tenfold less than continuing to smoke. And stopping at any age um, is, uh, it gives you benefit in terms of your life expectancy. And context-specific results um, translated in an engaging way to that population, I think, can have a big uh, impact on behaviour. But we can go beyond just looking at overall mortality. Um, and indeed, we can go beyond just looking at um, things that we know very strongly to be associated with smoking, like chronic lung disease. You can hear, see here the 35-fold increased risk, or lung cancer, the 20-fold increased risk of death. But we can go down to start looking in more detail at rarer endpoints that we've not previously been able to, to look at with much power. So for example, we can look at pulmonary fibrosis. I know Sharon showed it in some of her slides earlier. Um, and we can look at intestinal ischemia. But we're not just interested in um, chronic diseases and the classical exposures. We're also interested in the outcome of procedures um, and operations. Um, and with the hospital episode statistics data available in the UK, we can look at a whole range of things. So just to illustrate this, um, I'm showing you uh, some results for blood clots. I don't know how many of you in here have ever had surgery. How many of you have had surgery in the last 12 months? If you've had surgery in the last 12 months, you might want to look at this slide. But what we found is that the risk of having a blood clot was much higher um, in, in the immediate period following surgery than we'd previously believed. But perhaps even more interestingly, you have a sustained elevated risk for much longer than we previously thought. And this obviously has implications for post-operative care and also for, for surveillance and vigilance um, in the months and not just the weeks or the days after your surgery. And again, not all surgery is created equal. So perhaps unsurprisingly, we find that surgery um, for um, joint replacement or surgery for cancer is associated with the highest risks. So finally, just a couple of slides to tell you about another um, large prospective study that we're working on. And this, appropriately, is called EPIC. I think, um, uh, epic in scale and epic in maturity, similar to the Million Women study. It was recruited in the 1990s, and so therefore we've now accrued many endpoints. Uh, it was recruited across Europe, so the Million Women study across the UK, epic across Europe. Um, and we have 60,000 incident cases. Now, I'm personally particularly interested in prostate cancer. The men in the room, uh, your risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer is one in eight. So that's like one in every row or half a row. Actually, it, for women, it's one in eight for breast cancer. But for men, let's think about the men at the moment. Your risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer is one in eight. But staggeringly, in 2015, after years of epidemiological research, we still don't have any established modifiable risk factors for disease. We can't inform prevention. We don't understand what influences your risk of developing the disease, and we don't understand how we can modify that risk. So we've got 7,000 prostate cancer cases, and I just want to show you um, a brief illustration of how we can take these layers of data, these layers of exposures and biological information, genetic information, um, and detailed phenotyping of the endpoint to start to... Um, develop some more clues about what might be influencing risk of prostate cancer developing and how to prevent it. 
So one of the things we've been looking at, both in EPIC and in collaborations of EPIC and other studies together, is how hormones and growth hormones affect your individual risk of developing cancer. And there's this growth hormone called insulin-like growth factor 1. So in EPIC, we find that if you're a normal man and you have high levels in the top fifth, high levels of this growth factor, you have about a 50% elevated risk of prostate cancer. But I'm primarily interested in modifiable risk factors. So I suppose the first question that then occurs to me is, well, is IGF-1, is this growth factor modifiable? What can we see that's associated with it? Now, in EPIC, we had a wealth of dietary information as well as other exposure information. So when we looked, we find that with people, men with a high level of protein intake, particularly a high level of, dietary, of dairy protein intake, have high levels of this growth hormone. Well, that's really interesting, perhaps, but, but we don't really understand what it is about protein that affects IGF-1. And before we start to make any recommendations or take this further, we feel we need to understand the mechanisms involved. But with our biological collections and with advances in technology and allowing high-throughput omics assays, um, we're now starting to run some metabolomics platforms, um, partly looking to identify novel risk factors for prostate cancer, but also to try and understand things like, well, is it the amino acid um, balance of protein that affects IGF, that affects prostate cancer? And here's just some, some preliminary data that just gives you a taste, as many of you will be aware, of the whole spectrum of metabolites you can get out of a metabolomics platform with just 50 microliters of blood, so it doesn't deplete your blood sample collection hardly at all. 50 microliters of blood, you can now get information on 150 metabolites right sort of from amino acids right across the lipids. And, and, and we're too, it's too soon, really, to understand what's this going to contribute to population health. But certainly, it, asks us to ask, uh, it allows us to ask a whole variety of questions that we couldn't previously um, ask. But I'd just like to, to come back to the point that Christina so beautifully talked to us about this morning. Um, and that's the issue of um, how well do we understand our endpoints? And are we missing vital clues to disease etiology and vital clues to prevention by not sufficiently characterizing our endpoints and understanding them well enough? So I said one in eight of the men in here will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. But one in eight men in here won't be diagnosed with a prostate cancer that's aggressive, that's high risk, that's going to have some clinical impact on their life. Most of the prostate cancer diagnosed is clinically indolent. What we're really interested in is studying the prostate cancer that's going to become aggressive and is going to affect somebody's life expectancy. So we're interesting, interested in being able to identify those cases in our large prospective studies through looking at pathology data, through looking at stage and grade. But we're also interested in molecular characterization. So we now need to go beyond our um, traditional uh, biorepositories of blood samples, our questionnaire data, our electronic data linkage to health records, and we need to start pulling in tumour tissues, and we need to be thinking about clever ways we can work on our hypotheses, um, taking into account tumour heterogeneity. So I've briefly talked to you about two large cohort studies um, that are part of a family of studies that we work on in Oxford, but also um, there are many studies like that elsewhere around the world, not least in the US. And through these individual studies that are now accruing really substantial numbers of endpoints, not just of cancer, but of other diseases, um, not just common diseases, but increasingly large number of rarer diseases, I think we have a, a phenomenal and unprecedented resource for understanding the determinants of disease. Uh, and individually, uh, we've, we have uh, significant power, but, but more importantly, I think we have power by working together. So in Oxford, uh, where we find a hypothesis in um, the EPIC study, for example, on prostate cancer, we're also working in UK Biobank um, to try and replicate those, those results. And in Oxford, where we have um, results for interesting like growth factor in prostate cancer, for example, we have um, a collaboration that pulls all of the studies like EPIC in the world together, including um, the Kaiser Permanent Study, for example, to really have power to look not just at uh, interesting like growth factor in prostate cancer, but interesting like growth factor and subtypes of prostate cancer. And I think this is a model that we need to take forward. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>